Prior to that, I led tours with the National Audubon Society. So over the years, I think 1988 was the first year I started venturing overseas. But before that, I had done winter trips in Yellowstone and Utah and Big Bend and many of the places we hold dear today. So life really has been travel for me. And I love to talk about it. I'm hoping this Zoom is a chance to give you a little bit of tips of the trade. And I know it's overwhelming out there. There are just so many choices and so precious few years ahead. I know I'm now joining many of our clientele and crossing the line of, uh, let's just say we're on Medicare now. <laughs> and every trip seems so precious with life just there, getting a little bit slimmer in front of you. So I am dedicated to travel. I have a library surrounding me full of books. Every shelf is a different region. When I'm not out on the road, I can glance through them and just have a grand time thinking about travel in my mind and designing trips. And I had wanderlust as a child, but one of the things that inspired me the most was my own grandmother who used to travel and she took the train those days the airplane was not anywhere near our city she had to take the train to chicago and so my memories as a little child was holding my mother's hand and seeing my grandmother go off on the train and wave at us and then when she came back there were always little secret things in her suitcase and she just open her duty suitcase and say look in there there's something for you and there would be a little snow globe from Switzerland or some trinket or treasure. So we all arrive at travel in a different way, but I feel so fortunate it became my life's work and I share it with an amazing team of people. Most of us are women, it's just worked out that way. And we have gone remote almost 100% during the pandemic. And I'm so fortunate to share this Zoom with my colleague, Jessie, and she's going to introduce herself, and then I'll return to inspiration. But when I introduce myself, I might as well say I'm Naturalist Journeys because mm -hmm. it's deep in my blood, and it's been pretty much what I've done with life. I also have horses and dogs, and they're all contained. The dogs start locked in the bedroom. So they won't be coming in and the horse is in bed because it's dark, but she tries to get in the office sometimes too. Thanks, Peg. Um, I'm Jesse. I am the travel planner at Naturalist Journeys. This is my third year with Naturalist Journeys. Um, previously, I managed the hospitality department at the Nature Conservancy's Zapata Ranch in Colorado, where I first met Peg. Um, and we hosted a number of her groups there. And she also came out to, to do a uh, riding workshop and we got to know each other a little better. We're both horsewomen. Um, I'm a later in life birder, wildlife nature enthusiast uh, based out of Montana on a little hobby farm with my partner, Wes Larson. He is a bear biologist for the national, for Yellowstone National Park. And he is also a natural strings guide as of this year. Back to you, Peg. All righty, I'd be happy to take it back. Yeah, just start it so the clients can see it. We're just starting out our, our uh, images that come in the background of this. Um, our outline is after meeting the two of us, I was gonna start with talking about finding your inspiration. It's opening in three minutes. So we'll just talk about inspiration while it's opening. I think it's really important, and this I would, I would encourage you to do as an exercise. If you're an avid traveler or you're just thinking about traveling, if you can sort of hone in on what inspired you to even think of leaving home. A lot of us live in wonderful places. You're surrounded by family. You have meetings you go to or book clubs, things, but there's this itch to travel. And if you can spend some time on your next walk, or even scribble down some notes. It's almost like the exercise of scrapbooking. Find little pieces of your story and what inspired you to travel. I told you a little bit about my grandmother getting on the train. I think that one is indelible for me. But others, I know as a kid, we had lots of chances to see National Geographic specials and the magazine. 
And I remember one so distinctly, and it was the snow monkeys sitting in a thermal pool and the monkeys had all this beautiful snow around their faces. And I just thought, I've got to see that. And lo and behold, it's probably 40 years or more later, I am going to see those little guys in Japan in a couple of weeks. So I think all of us have these little beads on a string that we put in our travel inspiration bucket. And maybe you've kind of forgotten about them. You you don't really remember when you first thought, oh, I'd really like to go there or I'd really like to do this. Another National Geographic cover that in influenced me a lot was uh, the island of Circe in Iceland. I don't know if you remember that, but it blew up and created a new island and it was there before our eyes and you would see that at night, this island being born and then following it up with it actually poking out of the sea and starting to accumulate. I think my love of geology started there and wed to my interest in birds. Um, I think on our tours, we often share, how did you get inspired by birds? And people think about it, but I would really encourage you, and maybe at the end of the presentation, a few of you already have one in your brain you'd like to share, but finding your inspiration because it's cumulative. It's been put together since you were a child. And part of travel is finding and feeding that source that's within you and then put together with your experiences. So I think that when you look for that inspiration, you want to think about what would resonate for you. And then how do you prioritize that? Because if you're eclectic like me, I would like basically to go everywhere. <laughs> so it makes it quite hard to narrow down. And uh, so I think after you figure out your sources of inspiration, and I really would encourage everyone, don't leave the week go by without at least writing down 10, you know, 10 things that made you want to add this essence into your life. And and realize that not all people have that. We're, we can always laugh and say we're crazy birders, but we're also crazy explorers. We're just not quite content to stay only in the backyard. And I love living, knowing that I have friends across the globe and I really try hard to keep in touch. So the agenda here, you'll see we're gonna talk about these various things. We're gonna share it here my technical wizard okay hey are we on now are people seeing the images excellent great so there we have it we've kind of met both peg and jesse we've talked about inspiration and if you really get into that exercise send me an email i really would have fun looking at some of those and i know jesse would like to see them too and it's how do you prioritize and how do we put that all together? That's kind of what this Zoom is about. And that sense of being overwhelmed is like there's a whole world out there. You open a catalog. I, know, I can't believe it, but we offer now over 150 tours a year. I mean, that's overwhelming to me. And it's like, how would you pick and choose and narrow it down? So those were the skills I hope to leave you a little bit with after this evening Zoom and you've already met me they like they like this picture of me uh, this is in arizona so there you have it you think you go to arizona for sunshine and saguaros and you get off the bus and there's a cold northern canadian storm come down and there we had it looking out and one of the things about travel is sometimes you think you'll never lose something there's a huge ugly awful metal wall that goes right across that open wilderness landscape now so things change it's also a good inspiration to get going on your travels and there's jesse she's just the funnest person to work with she's always so positive and we throw yet a new tour at her. It's like, oh, Jesse, we're going to add Bhutan. And she's right there and researching and looking and um, comparing notes with her partner, Wes, about all the wildlife there and ready to go. So for many of us, we really, there's my snow monkeys right there that I hope to go see in Japan. But for a lot of us, 
the inspiration is a picture we have in our mind is we've seen pictures in magazines or we've seen um, documentaries, films, and then some things just stick. You know, some people are cat people and they really want to see all the cats of the world. And some people are dog people, bird people. So if you're going to join group travel, and group travel has so many positives. I'm here to dispel the idea that it wouldn't be a good choice. When you're independent, you match each experience to where you're at with the group, you fit in with the group. So it's good to know, for instance, if nature, wildlife, and birding is your thing. I broke it down into three types of approaches to that. And uh, I'll give you a little hint. There's the mission and the escape and then the experiential, sort of in between those two parts of the spectrum. I think mission people have the easiest time picking a trip because they're all about goals and lists and boundaries. And I wanna do this this year. And in five years, I wanna make sure I do that. I can really admire those people at times. And I can pick up elements of a mission on some of the tours that I do. But this is an example like Uganda, we see this incredible shoe bill. And I can't tell you the feeling of the people in the boats when they first see it. And especially those people that really came to Uganda to see the shoe bill. And in the very same boat will be people who had no clue of anything ever existing like a shoe bill. And they're having just as magical a moment. So travel you get to in different ways. But the mission driven people really don't suffer as much as we generalists and I'm a generalist so I can say that because it's pretty easy for them to go through things and pick and choose. So uh, I think we can take questions on that and I know I'm very happy to help with a mission, it may be that I'm not mission driven, but if people want to see as many hummingbirds, we had a woman just travel with us. She's a videographer. She wants to video hummingbirds. And we have mapped her way through Central and South America. Where can she add the most variety in her next trip? And she loves it. We've had people that want to see all the New World tanagers. Uh, it's very trendy right now. In fact, a couple of my guide friends are chasing around the globe because they would like to see one bird in each family of birds in the world. They know they're not going to see 10,000 birds, but they might get at least one in each family. And then we have people that love mammals. And mammal people have to be so much more patient than bird people. So you have to know your temperament, too, as well as your mission. But to see the world's rare mammals takes a skill, and it takes a focus, and it takes a patience. So we like to hear where you are on the spectrum. And if we identify that a mission is important to you, then we can help you choose better. And we can help you stair step your choices. So you do the easiest ones first, build up your skill level. And then by the time you get to the next place, you're much better at this so that you get the most out of your travel dollars. You, if you've never been out of the country birding, Going to Colombia is mind boggling and it's fun, but you sort of waste those travel dollars because the skills needed are going to be beyond you. You really should go to a simpler place, get your handle on it and work your way up and then dive into where there's the most variety. So the mission is one um, way. I think all of us in our life have had times where we are not on a mission, we just want to escape. And the pandemic certainly brought that out. All of a sudden we had people just like, I don't care where I go. I just have one week in January and I want to go. And I don't want to be too busy or whatever there is. So, you know, what's getting away? I mean, I would say the looking to escape is probably the most general travel theme out there. It's what the travel books and brochures are. It's the beautiful couple on the beach. It's the horseback ride in the desert. It's just all those kind of dreamy things that get you out of your world into a new world. And uh, your inspiration sources might be hard to list as 10, but 
escape mode probably is not hard to come up with 10 places you'd feel that. In these slides, um, this was taken, the, the upper left one is in Oaxaca, up in the mountains. And so we've been down in the valley, it'd been quite warm. And this gentleman had a fire going in his fireplace. You could smell the wood smoke, the birds were singing. And he just took an hour and read a book and had a great time. And then next to are my star players in the natural students office. That's Julie Fannin and Sarah Darty in Alaska. And the weather was ridiculously beautiful for us in Southeast Alaska. It, it, it's not supposed to be that way. You're supposed to have your raincoat and the umbrella. And we had a week of sun. And so there was just a chance within the tour, which was fairly busy and wildlife rich, to take moments to escape. So when you're planning a trip, if you really need to escape and that's all you need to do, it's probably gonna be more of a pace than you want to join a group birding tour. But you can always grab those moments for part of your group birding tour if that's high on your agenda. And then I think also escape isn't just about moments on the clock. It's about being fully absorbed. And this sunset yoga in Arizona, I took that with my iPhone and everybody was trying to hone in with their long lenses and, and there was a harrier flying over the grasses and everyone was having such a good time. We were all lost in the moment. So that's an example of escape elements. And some of our trips just inherently have more than others. And some of them have kind of the iconic sense of escape and others will surprise you because they're just such a different world and a different kind of escape. And I designed Naturalist Journeys experiences by myself for a lot of our 25 plus years. Now we have a great team that helps me and I think they're even getting better and richer. But when we look at this, I always place us in the middle because when people say, well, what's the difference between you and other companies? I think the heart of all that we do is that we want people to feel it. We want them to leave an adventure remembering the moments. And I always said as a guide, in five years, I don't really care if they remember me. I really care that they remember what it felt like to sit in Africa and look at a female lion grooming herself and then up comes a cub. You know, I. I love watching wildlife. If people ask me, what do I do in my free time? I say, well, I just do the same thing. I don't do it with clients. <laughs> so it's what I love to do. I love to watch animals. So um, when an eared quetzal made its way to portal, I felt like it was just a wonderful gift during the pandemic to pull us through. So experiential is a lot about you. It's about how you are taking in the experience and it, you can have the best bird list in the world 425 species and if you never got a good look at one was always a half mile behind the group and it just wouldn't be the kind of experience we'd want you to have so our guides often the expert is the in-country guide who knows where every blooming flower and mushroom and orchid and bird where those are and what we're doing a lot is scanning and trying to sense where are you what are, what's meaningful to your interaction with place and with wildlife so if you have the mission travel your mission is often a goal something you've written down escape is just something different than your regular life but experiential is kind of putting yourself in the learning mode wanting to experience something new New, new people in your life and new places and new places can take a while to try on I know like this is our world here this upper right picture of hiking in Arizona and it's a brown little world and we think it's beautiful because we live here we watch the play of light on the rocks we we know it and I've had people that turn around and go well there's not very many trees <laughs> and it's like oh I think trees get in the way of seeing the rocks so we all experience things differently and it's finding a trip the more you could say to jesse you know i really would like to go to a place where trees just surround me 
She's not going to suggest you come to Southeast Arizona. She's going to suggest you try the Olympic Peninsula, where the most amazing trees just tower over your head. So if you have any experiences you're looking for, that's another way we can help you a lot match up. And um, we try to coach people how to have the best experience, but it really is guided by nature and paying attention and being in the moment. And, you know, if you're this person in the upper left here scanning the Arctic, you don't want someone to ask you what your favorite egg salad recipe is. You know, you, you just want to really take it all in and be there. And it's so much fun to be social at the meals, but I think we try to give people a lot of field skills. On one of our tours, you can learn how to track your sightings in eBird. You can learn how to use a scope. They now make really lightweight spotting scopes, so even a small person can use one. And we can show you how to take pictures with your phone through the scopes. That's a lot of fun. We can show you how to use apps on the phone so that you can start to match up what you see. We can show you how to get the most out of a field guide. So there's a lot of skills that then open up experiences. They don't just happen. And sometimes um, it'll be a participant that runs into dinner and just says, come outside. And we're very good at just leaving our plates and running and going. We've been laughed at a lot, but that's the kind of tour we like to run. We don't like to drive up a mountain road and see the most beautiful view in the world and not stop and take a picture. I mean, we do have a lot of birds we wanna see, a lot of experiences we wanna have, and hopefully we've done the road before you so we have a sense of where the experiences start to roll out and then they add to each other to make the story. And sometimes we go places where there's a lot of people. Here's the biggest week birding in Ohio. And you might think, well, I can do that on my own. And then all of a sudden you go with Dan Donaldson who lives there and works for the parks department. And he knows all the great restaurants and you get to go on field trips you would have never known about. So we try to be, um, a window into a larger experience. And so we fall in that middle ground. And this slide is near and dear to my heart. I hope you can all see it. Is this trip for you? I had hip surgery a month ago on November 9. And on October, <laughs> the last two weeks, I went to Peru. It was probably not one of my wisest decisions, but it was one of my best trips. But it is a trip that you're interfacing pretty primitive parts of the planet. And that's why you see things like we saw harpy eagle, we saw jaguar, we saw probably 18 species of parrots and macaws. We saw 48 species of flycatchers. I mean, it was a great, great trip. But having a hip that did not work at all and then having them say, oh, come on, I'll help you. <laughs> and this was like, how we got in the boat. And it was, um, it's good to know and be able to ask someone when you're considering a trip, the more images you can look through, this might solve it. Now that was just one day and it was a little tricky, but once they saw we had trouble, he moved the boat to a place that was a little more secure, but they're young and they, they carry all our suitcases up that. So when you are, kind of secure in what's your style. Do you, do you want to do a trip where you feel a sense of accomplishment, check some things off your list? Maybe you're building your North America list. You're almost to 400. If you just saw 30 more species, you get there. You want to pick a trip rich in species. If you want to like stay in a forest cabin or have some beachside place, sometimes it's accommodations. One of the things to think about are what are the accommodations like? And is that a good match for you? So I started doing this ridiculously long time ago. 40 years ago, there weren't luxury eco lodges. We just hope to stay clean and warm and get fed. We took a lot of buses around. We kept our gear light. But you know, something like the picture on the left would have seemed like a palace to us back then. And now 
it's been transformed for a more general audience. So there are birding lodges that could be equally known as a yoga retreat or a spa. Um, some of the camps in Botswana are bigger than my home, particularly the bathroom. It has an indoor shower, an outdoor shower, an unbelievable sense of, of specialness. I wouldn't say luxury in the sense of a five-star hotel. I would say luxury and feeling like, am I the princess of the day or how is it possible I'm waking up here? And I want that experience. So if Jesse and I know when you call, like, do you need to feel like a princess this week? You're gone and be a little bit spoiled or are you ready to be an adventurer and a simple cottage that's warm, clean, good food, that's good enough. So ask us about accommodations. We always try to put names where we can. Now, sometimes those change. I know it's hard for a person in the US to understand, but in other countries, sometimes they double book. They just can't believe that these two groups that book will both come. So they hedge their bets and all of a sudden we're all coming <laughs> and they don't know why you won't just share rooms. So we have to tell them, no, we're not gonna share rooms. We'll go to the hotel down the road. It doesn't happen very often and we're better at, at uh, really sending your funds on ahead of time. So we secure those great spots, but ask about accommodations. You might want to ask or consider uh, the social factors of the trip because some trips are just inherently more fun. And for many of you, maybe you live a pretty regular life when you have your friends, you enjoy them, but meeting new people is a good driving factor. Just another couple to sit down with and, and enjoy over dinner. You find someone else that does woodworking or you find someone else that does quilting. There's a lot of connections made and those are rich parts of trips. And I can tell you, we've had a few romances too because some of the couples that travel with me actually met on our trips. But a lot of friendships have been made and it's a pretty special part of the trip. And you can look down the itinerary and some are pretty focused on the field experience. So you pretty much have a early breakfast, get out there, see wildlife all day, break for lunch, little rest, go back out. Those trips are pretty focused. And there's other trips where you look and you're like, oh, we take a little boat trip or, oh, there's a chance to go horseback riding or, oh, I'll get half a day off here in this Oaxaca city to go around and buy a rug. So talk to us about that. It's like, how important is the social to you and how important is mixing up the field time with fun. Those are good things to ask about. And then just in general, the pace. I know, and I, you learn things over the years and I have done this a very big number of years. And I can remember early on when we used the word relaxing and relaxing meant eight or 10 hours of field time instead of 15 or 14. And so we have to always watch how we use our language, because if you don't bird watch a lot or spend a lot of time out in the field, you may not be used to doing it. You know, two sessions a day that are four or five hours, um, those hours go really fast when you're seeing special things. You really aren't thinking about the time, but I would say an average birding tour, you are outside in the field with your guide looking for things, often eight hours a day. And that would be shorter on a travel day where you have more bus travel or van travel, get out, take a look at things. But it, pace isn't just about, can I do the walking? It's about how much of the tour uh, will we be staying at a lodge where I could take an afternoon off if I want? Well, if you look at the tour list of hotels, anywhere you stay for three nights is golden, if that's what you like to do, because You'll have two full days there, sometimes not even getting in the car. And if you just want a break, you can take it. Whereas some of the birding tours, it's one night here, one night here, one night here, so they can position themselves for the best strike for the morning. So the pace is all about how often you move, how much time you're outside. And some of you may be just the opposite. You may wanna ensure, gosh, if I'm going all the way to Borneo, 
I like to know we're going to spend a lot of time in the field. You know, I'm not going to Borneo to read my book. I really want to have field time. So I hope these tips are helpful. The other thing we find out is people have temperatures that they're comfortable in. So if you really don't like heat, but you'd like to see the new world tropics, ask us because like Jesse will tell you, Costa Rica is mountainous. So you get a break. You can go down in the lowland forest for a couple of days, pop up in the mountains and cool off. Whereas Guyana, it's flat. Once you're in the lowland forest, you've got to be able to be comfortable enough at a temperature. Um, this is obviously a polar trip and kind of playing on the theme of I have to say winter Japan. Now that I live in Arizona, I did many winters in Montana. I know what Jesse lives in now and, uh, and in Wyoming. So I put in my winter years, but it was probably 65 out today. So winter Japan, I'm bundling up and I'm packing so that I can stay comfortable. But I may not be as avid about the cold trips as I once was. And then humidity. So I live in the desert. So when it rains on a tour, I'm one of the few in the group that isn't disappointed. It's like, I never get to see that. <laughs> so I'm sometimes going out going, let's go for a walk because I just want to hear it and smell it and see it. But some of our trips are in a temperate rainforest. You, you, if you, any week of the year, if you go to the Olympic Peninsula, you may have a good rain, but it's a whole part of the ecology. In the New World tropics of Central America, they often have really good rates at the lodges in the summer, but it will rain. It doesn't rain all day. It rains hard for a couple of hours, then it breaks and clears. But think about wet and dry and what you're in the mood for. And then I say with both those things, it's really a good idea to mix it up because the mission-driven people will be like, okay, I'm going to get after, I'm going to do Central America, I'm going to do Honduras and Costa Rica and Belize. And, and sometimes that's too much the same right in a row. So if you have a variety of destinations you want to go to, I always think it's really good to mix it up. And that can even be true with doing, say, three African safaris in a row. It's just not quite as special than when you get a break. And maybe you went to the rainforest and remembered, oh, it's kind of hard to see things way up there in the canopy. And then your next safari where it's wide open and you can see the whole world, you're like, yeah. So mixing up temperature, humidity, and then biodiversity. For me, that's a real barometer. Um, I love to go to those places with big numbers of species or small numbers of species that are just all different. The polar regions are never going to have big numbers, but you're going to be able to see an ivory gull or uh, snow petrel or some of those things. So mixing it up is a great thing when choosing an adventure. Here's a couple of, you know, mix it up. It's just, again, a little overwhelming to choose. So ask us about what some of the places feel like in terms of habitat and experience and temperature and accommodations. We actually, this is in Morocco. And this is within a mile of our regular hotel and the regular hotel actually outfits this, but it's just amazing. They have bathrooms in these tents full with showers and you can wake up at dawn and just go right up for a walk on the dunes. That was really neat. And yet we never were super remote. We weren't being asked to live like a Bedouin, but we got to have a little of their ambiance. I like boats a lot. Anytime I can get in a boat, I enjoy that very much. Um, yeah. So I think, let me just check my notes and see if I walked you through some of the, the basics of what questions to ask. And then maybe we can open it up for a few questions or perhaps Maybe Jesse and I can just talk a little bit more about our favorites and then open it up for questions. Um, Jesse, do you want to pop in with some of your favorites? Sure. Um, let's see. I wonder if yours, oh, we don't have a slide for that. I'm happy to go with mine. Um, for anyone who knows me, it's an easy pick. It was 
Brazil this October. Um, my partner, Wes, he lived there for a few years in the early 2000s, and he's always wanted to take me. Um, so it was the opportunity of a lifetime this year to join him when he guided one of our trips uh, in October. And it was even more fun because we had a few past clients that I've traveled with James with before on the trip. Um, so it was a bit of a reunion and we got to have them along as well. Um, I fell in love with the culture, the food, the language. Um, it doesn't hurt that Wes speaks Portuguese, made it pretty easy. Uh, and of course the wildlife. Um, the biodiversity was so rich. From the moment we left the airport, we it just accelerated from there. Um, the lodge grounds had so many birds, mammals, reptiles. I feel like Wes was constantly bringing a tarantula or a frog or something into our room <laughs> late at night to show me what he found. Um, the grounds were just fantastic. Uh, you know, we had caracaras, super cheeky everywhere, tapir in the water. Uh, the cherry on top was our floating houseboat hotel. Um, we saw a jaguar, one of four, from our hotel room. This is that picture there, right, yeah. Jesse? Huh? The, Isn't this one of your pictures? Let's see. Oh, yep. Yeah, I think Wes took that one. Um. It was fantastic. I mean, we really, for being so far away from home, I really feel like we had so many comforts from home. Um, and I'm already plotting my my next trip back. I work a lot with Pam Davis, who is the travel agent that we have available for you if you are a little daunted by doing the ticket. She and a couple of her colleagues at Willamette Travel are really great at researching options and then giving you choices. And then, boy, they just stay with you the whole time if you need more help. But I asked Pam what her favorite trip is, and she said, oh, it's always the one I'm on right now. <laughs> So, or about to head off on it right now, but I know that's a question I think I get almost every trip is what's your favorite trip and I really don't know what my favorite trip is I think it'd be like asking someone with six children, who's your favorite child I mean these trips are sort of like my children, and on one day, one is favorite more than the other and then it switches but I would say in general, the question I could answer is if I had one more trip, if the gods above just said, Peg, you've got one more, what is it going to be? I would definitely go to Africa. That I don't even, there's no hesitation there at all. Is it my favorite? My favorite's the one I'm immersed on readily, but I think you can see there are more and more Africa trips cropping up into Naturalist Journey's repertoire. And I, I find it very exciting because it's a continent. It's just like exploring the US. There's so many different parts of it. And yet all the Africa trips are quite different from each other. So if that continent appeals to you, I'd be happy to go through some of the, the choices. Probably the most general of our trips, the most like a trip you've taken before is South Africa. South Africa is modern, so there's good roads. They really value accommodation, so those are special. And you have the finbos in these flower-rich areas where you're not bumping around in a safari vehicle. You're taking hikes. Your, your vacation is quite varied over the time. And you do an actual safari in four-wheel drive vehicles in Kruger Park. But South Africa is often just a really super first trip or someone who wants to get a big sampler. And then I think for everybody who's read Africa books, like Jane Goodall was some of our first, but so many, George Schauer, all of these, a lot of the wildlife research in Africa, documentaries, et cetera, come from Kenya and Tanzania. And you'll find that we do those countries one, if not more times a year, because they are just the wildlife heart of Africa. And that's in East Africa, sort of the central part of the continent. And um, different times of year, this uh, fall date showing here, are actually a new area of Tanzania, it's sort of 
all of Tanzania beyond the Serengeti. So it's their Sky Island mountain ranges, some very unique endemic birds, and then two of the great wildlife parks that are in the south. And then we also do the more classic Serengeti. And then Namibia and Botswana are less populated, less traveled, just gorgeous landscapes and abundant wildlife. So th those are another area. Botswana made a choice a long time ago. They developed so far past the time Kenya and Tanzania did. I mean, Kenya has been doing a lot of safari tourism since the 1960s, and some of the lodges have a lot of history. And Botswana was late to arrive on the scene and they made the choice. We can never handle all these tourists. So they went for very upmarket and very small. So there are a string of camps around the protected areas and often they only have eight tents. That's all they have. And what they call a tent, I could live in year round in Arizona. They're beautiful. They have furniture and fabrics. And so Botswana is a treat yourself very high end if you want it to be that way. And then Namibia is famous for the dunes. Um, Morocco, oh, I thought was extraordinary. I, it was a painted landscape. It was just as gorgeous as our Utah, Southwest Canyon country. And everywhere you turned, there was striped rocks and beautiful water courses through the desert. And I just found it quite exotic and saw a lot of new species. Uganda, I have been so thrilled to watch them emerge. Um, they had a political hell within my lifetime and it was very difficult for people living there. And to watch them come out of that, some of their parks were ravaged as people just tried to feed themselves. They were poaching wildlife, they were cutting trees. And tourism took a really important step in getting protections for areas and also community engagement. And I'm excited to announce I've been asked to be a speaker at the International Women's Conference in Birding in Uganda next December. So that's why you see a trip late November, December. My colleague Andrea Molina in Ecuador and I are going there to support this really concerted effort to train women and get them in the guiding field. And then the newest kid on the block is Ghana. And I'm I'll admit this is our first time there. I'm very excited. It's a forested area. So a lot of our British travelers and our guides from Europe have all gone. It would be very much like you going to Costa Rica. If you lived in Europe, you would go to Ghana. And so really looking forward to seeing the forested parts of Africa. So maybe I'll pass this back to you, Jesse. If you want to talk a little bit about the variety and diversity we have right here in the states? Sure. Um, we have a lot of trips. I think winter were pretty well sold out up until March. There's still a few spaces left. You can see there, I don't know if you can stroll down a bit, Peg. Um, we've got Death Valley, another Platte River trip, um, Alabama, Georgia, Arizona. Um, there's a lot of great options for a winter escape that aren't too far from home. Um, and you don't have to fly Southwest if you don't want to, they're really easy to get to. Um, yeah, I mean, we're really help, happy to help with, with anything domestic too. It's, it's not just about international. Um, these are great fillers for, for an easy trip close to home. Yeah, we have such such a diverse country. I, I said if they, my travel wings were clipped, I could stay in Arizona and New Mexico for a very long time. So we love having groups come to Arizona and uh, we have a couple of fabulous caterers that are on our staff and locally here and get to have people right in our own niche. So a lot of our U.S. trips are about migration. So the biggest number of them occur in April, May, and then again in September and October. So as wildlife moves up and down that amazing corridor, and we're hoping with these rains in California, it's going to be a spectacular flower year. Death Valley is always hard to predict that. Didn't have quite as much fall rain as the predictive model would like to have, but I'm hoping those dates are just golden. I really do and uh, might have to head out there myself. 
I will but, say yes. I, I would say if you, I Peg, I know you're partial to Arizona, and I just wanted to say she's she's not wrong. We have the the monsoon madness trips on, on speaking of rain, uh, and it's it's fantastic. It is summer, but the greenery is is like nothing I've ever seen in my life in Arizona. You can't find it anywhere else. And it's just, she knows it best, but Arizona is, it, it's a real gem. And then I, I have to scroll back because I think all of you know how dear and, and life forming my years in Montana and Wyoming were. And there's hardly a trail in Yellowstone I didn't find myself on. I didn't get them all, but pretty close. <laughs> And it's so much fun that now Jesse and Wes are rooted there and it's one of our greatest national parks. So you'll see Yellowstone spring and fall. Um, the fall photographers love it because the racks are out on the animals, their coats are all beautiful. You see the same animals in spring, but the theme is sort of bad hair day because they're all shedding. So spring is great for the birds and the singing, but there's nothing like fall for elk bugling and the fall color coming in on the river areas. And, and gosh, I don't wanna go so long you don't have questions. Let me move a little bit closer or quicker through Europe. All I can say is we have just had an explosion of interest in Europe. And part of that is we have such great connections and guides now. We've really worked hard to develop that. And one of our guides, Jared Gorman, lives and resides in Austria and, excuse me, in Hungary. And his trip to Austria and Hungary, you feel like you're meeting his friends. You sit down in this little play lodge in the Book Hills and eat your beautiful brothy meat dish with bull's blood wine and it is so wonderful to see those European birds in that central core there that's a great European trip I met Jared because we asked him to develop that for us and that was gosh 2014 or something and since then we've really expanded he also does the Romania Bulgaria trip which is a delta experience in a migration time the birding is out of this world uh, Finland and Norway, I think last year on their second day, they'd seen five species of owls. It was crazy. They really had a lot of fun working the whole length of that country. And then Scotland, we have the most perfect lodge. They have maybe 30 single malt scotches. The mission-driven people want to try everyone. But they have a fire in the fireplace and you're out when there's still a lot of wildflowers and uh, anything in the UK is just a lot of fun and very beautiful. And then in the fall, Portugal, and we put Spitsbergen in that sort of north of Europe, getting into the polar regions, but absolutely incredible to be in the realm of ice. And it's worth it almost for just the flight from Norway up to Spitsbergen, get a window seat and you will see glacial geology in action. You just see miles and miles of ice. And then when your boat is parked, so you're perfectly safe and you just get to watch these big beasts and walrus and that's a great place. So I think I can go quickly here because I've talked a lot about our guides opening doors to us. That's the real growth of Naturalist Journeys. At first, it was mostly myself and a very small company. And we've kept the flavor small, but we've expanded the expertise, the connections, the networks. And that's why we're able to um, you know, help you find so many things. So, Okay, I think Jesse wanted to buzz through a little bit of the techniques because our website can be confusing and then we'll open it up to questions. So we have a little video. Um, I think is if Kylie's there, she could pull that up. <laughs> the first video. We still have that, hopefully. Yeah. We've got a little how-to. Um, but I think I will say that we have a really great user-friendly website um, where you can view all of our upcoming tours. 
past trip reports and species lists, guide profiles, COVID policies, terms and conditions. You can make your inquiries and booking requests there. Um, and we have a really fun blog that we update regularly as well. I think this is a little tutorial here. It looks like it might be lagging. So would you like me, Jesse, to make you the um, uh, the host so you can uh, pull up the website and buzz through it? But I think what's happening is the video is playing, but it's lagging. Sure, give me just a second. Go ahead. Okay, I'm doing that now. Just, okay. Now I'm going to make you the host. Okay, now you are the host. Okay, let me make this a little bigger. Can you guys see that okay? Uh, right now, I think we uh, have you shared the screen yet? Because I don't think we're seeing your face, but not the shared screen. Which is the button at the bottom uh, in the middle. There we go. Now we can see it. Thank you. Okay. That's much better. All right. Here's our website. Um, right here we have, um, all of our tours are here on our destination tabs. You can see all tours here. Click that link and you can view it by region. Oh, now I have slow internet. So you can view by destination here. If you click one of these locations, it will pull up everything that we have in the region. Um, a viewfinder I really like is our calendar right here. And you can see it by year, by month. We're updating this constantly. If you see a trip that you like, we just added this one and it is pending full, but you can click on it. You'll get an overview, the full itinerary here. If you go all the way to the bottom, we have a printable itinerary right there that you can click on and print. Photo gallery, costing and details, a past trip report and species list, the guide, we've got Greg Butcher, a map, and your details are condensed right here. Um, if you have more questions about a specific trip like this one, you can just fill out this contact form here and it'll go directly to us. If you want to book a trip, request to book a trip, you can click this tab right here, book your trip. fill out this little form here. It also has details like our terms and conditions, deposit and payment schedule, um, our phone number is right there. We have our trip reports here and species lists. I really like that uh, recently Julie changed it. So now you can view the trip reports and species lists inside of each of the tours themselves. So you can do it both ways. Right. Yep. Yeah, so if you had a trip in mind, say Arizona, and you wanna know what November was like, you can view the trip report right here. Our guides write that up. It's a really good inside view into what you can expect. Day by day, super detailed photos, and then the species list as well. I think that's about it for the website. Peg, did you want to take it over for questions? Or do I oh, why don't you go ahead? You can start start them and we'll each answer the one appropriate. Okay. How do I stop screen sharing, Carrie? Uh, you can go to the bottom where it says share screen and click it again, or 
I can just reclaim the host and then it'll go away. You want me to do that? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I have so many tabs right now. I can't find it. And let's have let's have Carrie moderate the question. <laughs> okay. We'll so, ask I'm, Carrie to moderate. so I'm back to being the host. Um, let's look at the, uh, I'll look and see which ones we have in the chat already. Okay, let's go down to the bottom. Do your independent birding ventures mirror group trip itineraries or is there potential for unique itineraries? Ped. That's a really good question. We try to always have people aware of the group itineraries because it's a real good way of seeing what would you like to do and what would the experience be like, but we can combine them in different ways. So if you're going to Belize and you have 12 days, we'll talk to you about our recommendation will probably be three lodges. And then it's more like a module where you could pick the three. So we can customize. One of the tricks for us is keeping up with heavy levels of customization when we're also very busy. So for really complex custom, we ask for a longer lead time. But I just had someone today, they had one week, they wanted to get away. They said, can you fix me up in Belize? And we will get them fixed up. We know some wonderful lodges and we can quickly check availability and combine them to make the independent work. Okay, that's great. I'm not seeing any additional questions here in the chat. So if anyone has any more questions, feel free to type it in there. There is one here. Okay. It says, um, your trip reports look wonderful. Do you use local guides as well as your guides? Okay. And do you want to go ahead and answer that, uh, Jesse? I think Peg can speak in more detail, but I do know we, we use local guides definitely internationally, um, and they're great. And we, on those international trips, your Natural Journeys Guide is really a host. Um, and just an additional guide, but our local guides steal the show. They're fantastic. They're they're great. They know the area. They know exactly where they've been spotting. You know, what bird, what mammal. Um, they're fantastic. They're really charismatic. They're just they're scene stealers every time. They're great. That's great. And Peg, how are you? I could have. Yeah, I could add a, just a little bit to that. I, I think part of that's also come from my commitment. I started doing these tours at the time when a lot of the local guides could not speak English. So they were often sort of pushed aside with a U.S. guide coming and being more dominant. And then they would help the U.S. guide because they just didn't have the communication skills to reach you. And I've watched in my years, if I, if I ever have time and write a book, the story of the local guides we have watched and see them come into their own with intense study in the field and then learning from visiting groups and then just taking off on their own. I feel very strongly that the places we go are often under threat. And if we don't empower the local guides who are the lifeline to conservation in those places, we're not taking advantage of the best way to do eco travel. And so our company, now some local guides are not ready for it and we know that. So we'll pair one of our strongest guides with them as a host. Um, a tour like Belize, I see James Smith is watching. He is so great to tie the three local guides together because there we go lodge to lodge to lodge. And he has helped them. We've gotten them cameras. We're both really interested in their um, skills improving all the time. And they're starting to run away from us. They're just amazing. They now have a photo group. They have some conservation projects with hawk watching. I would say, um, you know, the first times I went to Africa, I had to translate all the time and they were speaking English. But, you know, we would criticize them and say, could you speak English? And they're like, we speak the Queen's English. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been a long journey. Um, yeah, I really believe in using local talent and not upstaging them, but we always want to have one of our guides there if we can. So if situations come up, we can be an intermediate. We want to help with a scope and the bird list and all the things and the fun. You know, we often know a little bit better what our people like. We can look at the group and go, 
mm, I better get back today. Everybody wants a shower. And that's what's hard for a local guy. They don't know the culture as much, so they can't really see in your face that, yes, it's nice to wait for this bird, but how about a shower? <laughs> this next question, Peg, uh, kind of feeds right into that. They're asking how many people are on a typical trip. And I guess we could add to that. And when do you decide to send a naturalist journeys guide and kind of explain that to people as well? Sure. Um, we would always send a naturalist journeys guide on a new trip or on a trip where we felt the local guide wasn't someone we really knew well. But for instance, in Costa Rica, I've worked with Johan now. Johan Fernandez is one of our guides there. We've worked together for close to 20 years. So, you know, I trust Johan with the groups as much as I trust our regular guide team. So that's a little bit specific to the trip. But in general, you need about six or seven people to make a trip happen. But maybe a local guide's quite good and they're willing to run it with four. So we use that option when we can. A place like Trinidad and Tobago, we know all those guides really well. So if it's small, we'll send it out with the local guides as long as we know they're at a certain level. And then we typically send a United States-based guide with six or seven people. And I would say most of our tours are between eight and 10 or 11 people. Uh, 12 is a full group. We really don't it's unusual we take more than that. It might be a safari thing where it's modules of a certain number of people to a vehicle, but in general, between eight and 12. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, and this one says, we can't wait for our Panama trip in April. This is from Elizabeth. And she says, however, I'm wondering why you don't include airfare and ground transportation in your trip. Okay. I could tackle that one. Sure. All right. Um, gosh, you know, the United States is just too big. We we can sometimes, if you call us and say, hey, I'm looking at my flights, I'd like to fly with someone, we can say, well, see, we see these three other people go through the hub of Houston at this time. But the way the flights work in the US from a hub, for instance, I can get a better rate maybe going to Africa on Qatar and I want to fly through Philadelphia and then a direct over to Africa. So we we do work with a travel agent and they're really good at, at grouping people within the tour, but people have miles they want to use. Our people are pretty independent. A lot of them go early. So we've never used that model of including air, but we are certainly welcome to connect you to other travelers itineraries so you could track that if you wanted to join someone. Next question. What is the age mix of clients on a typical trip? Jesse, why don't you take that one? Oh gosh, it's such a big range. I would say mid 40s to 80s all across the board. It's a pretty good mix. It always makes for a really fun group. And how are you able to um, get a sense for people's abilities and skill level in terms of their ability to, uh, I guess, be mobile and move around? Is that something that you, is there an intake process where you ask that, that kind of, those kind of questions? Jesse. Usually if someone has something specific, they would ask ahead of time. Um, most of the trips, it's really specific if there's one and, and we'd red flag it if, if it was at an accelerated pace. But I think for the most part, most trips, you're welcome to sit out at any time. You know, usually there's an afternoon excursion that people will opt out of um, or a boat ride or something in particular. Being able to walk one to two miles a day at a birder's pace, it, it's pretty casual. Um, I think we're pretty specific if the pace is, is anything other than that. Um, but I will get people that ask specifically and, and, and we'll talk about what trip would be best. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, we have another question here. It says, I love to travel, especially when I can experience local guiding. And I have such concern about the carbon crisis and wanting not 
not to compound the destruction of the very nature we love. What thoughts do you have about the impact of travel and climate change, Peg? Well, I can say, and it's good to see you, Sarah, and it's such an important question, and it is one we all wrestle with. This is the kind of things that guides getting together often talk about. I talk to my colleagues in other countries, and I think we, we feel that it's really tough for people to love and conserve what they don't experience. So it's really hard to balance the need to stay close to home and not use fuels with the need to get in there and bring an economy based on preserved lands and species to another part of the world. And I can tell you the day that people stop getting in airplanes to go on safari in East Africa, those parks will fail in a decade. There's, there's no way they will be preserved intrinsically. And so those are the things you wrestle with. What we've tried to do as a company that feels like uh, the things that we can do to help is to try to tailor our model of travel to small lodges, very local experiences, light footprint lodges. We try not to stay in big glitzy resorts. And so we look at the footprints of the places we go uh, for a number of years before the pandemic, we worked with a company for carbon offsets and we sort of set St. Louis as the model with the distances and then we put in a fund and amount to help offset the flights. And we were able to turn was, you know, probably 20 to $30,000 a year over to these projects. And you know, we, we wanted to do something to mitigate particularly the air travel and then on the ground to keep the lightest footprint we could and benefit local communities. It's not a perfect world. I, I know in my own life, I live incredibly simply and that helps me not feel as guilty for how many miles I fly in a year, but I would be having a pretty big carbon footprint. But I feel like if I do all the good I can in the world to make sure there's a place for wildlife when I go, that's how I balance it. But we feel very passionate about trying to do something. And you know, our guides really help with that. They'll come back and say, Peg, that hotel is using all disposable dishes. We just need to find another alternative or take our dishes or, um, our guides are the eyes in the field. So they come back to us and say, we'd really like to support this lodge more because they're just doing it in the right way. So accountability, we all have to try to face in our lifetime. And it's a really tough, tough thing to weigh. Okay, well, I think we're at the end of the questions. I know I can say, I think this was a wonderful presentation. And uh, if anybody has anything else they want to add, this would be a good time. We had a good group, 50 people showed up. I think it was a wonderful presentation. And we're getting some- Any, any inspiration stories? Did anybody wanna share uh, how they got going on all the travel? Somebody must've had a spark somewhere. <laughs> Shy ones. Well, when you get it, you can email me. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. This was inspiring. That's what we're hearing. Okay, and hopefully this uh, this presentation recorded well. And if so, we'll be able to share it to uh, to Naturalist Journeys Facebook page tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, guys, and Happy New Year! Happy New yes. Year! <laughs> okay, bye bye. Bye bye. I hate to see everyone go. <laughs>